Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Loving Father, we thank you. We honor your holy name for your goodness upon our lives. We pray, O oh God, and invite you in our midst this afternoon. Give us the insight, the wisdom, and understanding we need to have in your word. Be the Lord of this afternoon. Speak to your servant to us. This and many more we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Father. Amen. Yes, sister. So Ezekiel prayed. Eh? Yes. You pray. But Ezekiel told God, Lord, look at my faithfulness. Can we see him? <laughs> <laughs> That's the issue. So it's not just about the prayer, but the heart of prayer. The heart so, of Lord, prayer. look at my faithfulness and answer me. So let us be faithful so that God will answer us. Stephen is so much happy dying. And he's so much going to enjoy death simply because he remained faithful to the end. And I know when we remain faithful to the end, we'll be able to enjoy death too at the end of our lives. So let us learn from Stephen and remain faithful so that when it is time for us to die, we can die faithfully. Sure. We started listening to his final speech. Let's keep in mind that this is not a revival speech. It's not a crusade. It is an answer to a question in S100. They have asked him a question at a meeting where only the authorities are gathered. And the answers he gives is what you have been learning deep lessons from. And today I know we will finish with the answers and the Lord will teach us further lessons. So I will let our able, accurate, and very powerful reader, Sister Barbara and our host, to help us read. Pick your Bible, ask chapter 7. We ended at verse 24 the other time, I guess 29 the other time. So we start with verse 30 of us of the apostles. And I know the Lord is going to transform us and make us whole. Amen. Amen. So Acts of the Apostles, chapter 7, verse 30. Now when 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai in a flame of fire in a bush. When Moses saw it, he wondered at the sight. And as he drew near to look, the voice of the Lord came. I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God and of Isaac and of Jacob. And Moses trembled and did not dare to look. And the Lord said to him, Take off the shoes from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. I have surely seen the ill treatment of my people that are in Egypt and heard their groaning. And I have come down to deliver them. And now come. I will send you to Egypt. This Moses whom they refused, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge? God sent as both ruler and deliverer by the hand of the angel that appeared to him in the bush. He led them out, having performed wonders and signs in Egypt and at the Red Sea and in the wilderness 40 years for 40 years this is the Moses who said to the Israelite God will raise up for you a prophet from your brethren as he raised me up this is he who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him at Mount Sinai and with our fathers. And he received living oracles to give us. Our fathers refused to obey him, but trust him aside. And in their hearts they turned to Egypt, saying to Aaron, 
make for us gods to go before us. As for this Moses who led us out from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And they made a calf in those days and offered a sacrifice to the idol and rejoiced in the works of their hands. But God turned and gave them over to worship the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophet. Did you offer to me slain beasts and sacrifices? For forty years in the wilderness, O house of Israel, and you took up the tent of Moloch and the star of the god Rephan, the figures which you made to worship, and I will remove you beyond Babylon. Amen. Amen. So let us do a bit biblical studies, then a bit theology. Then we also pick the lessons as you normally do. So at the last end, you hear some names of some gods. You hear of Molech. Then you hear of Raphan. Um, you don't see them in the Old Testament, do you? Oh. That should tell you the version Stephen used in quoting and preaching in defense of the Sahindrin. It's not the version of the Old Testament we have. And that should let you understand why it is not strange that the Old Testament version of the Catholic Church is different from the Old Testament version of our other brethren. Many get the impression that the Catholic Church have added books. But we didn't add even a single book. Possibly, since the Catholic Church existed and used this 73 book Bible until our brothers joined us and later on separated, became Protestants, a thousand years after, more than a thousand years after, and then they went in for a 66 book, it is correct for us to say they rather took some books out than to say the Kalis added some books. So we see a reading from the Greek version of the Bible, the Septuagint, and we discover that there are even passages quoted in the New Testament that cannot be located in the Old Testament books we are holding. And that should let us know that divine revelation cannot be limited to the 66 book Bible our brothers hold so dear unto. And that is even the only copy many Catholics even have. And I think it is a pity for a Catholic to be holding a 66 book Bible when we know it is 66 plus 7. I, I don't want to say 73. Is it? Is a 66 plus 7 Bible. That's the Bible. That's the proper Bible. Old Testament of 49 books. Uh, no, uh, uh, 39 plus 7 books, 46 books, the New Testament of the normal New Testament we have. You know, we have two canons. If I'm to go a bit far, I, would, I just wanted to branch that aside, but it looks a bit interesting to you. We had two canons. The one Bible, one of the ancient manuscripts was written with the Greek language, and one was written with the Hebrew language. The differences were seven books. Now, the Jews in Palestine the pure Jerusalem land, said the Greek language is pagan, demonic, evil, and ungodly. So any book written with Greek cannot come from God. So they rejected all the books that were written in pure Greek. And that is why even the Esther in the, I don't know if you are holding the 66 book Bible, you will discover that the Esther in your Bible is shorter than the Esther in the Septuagint, the Catholic Bible. You will discover that the Daniel in your Bible is shorter than the Daniel in the Catholic Bible. Simply because they edited out all the Greek language versions in the word of God. And the Catholic Church knew from the experience of Jesus. I'm using the Jerusalem Bible study edition. And what it does is that all the quotations from the Old Testament are altalized. To you, for you to discover that these texts are italicized, they are from the Old Testament. And all those passages from the Old Testament are from the Septuagint. The Septuagint is a 46 book Old Testament record. Meaning, Jesus and the disciples use the booklets the Catholic Church is using, the books the Catholic Church is using. 
Because at a point, Paul will quote Maccabees. Paul quotes from Sirach. He quotes from Ecclesiasticus. He quotes from wisdom. He quotes from Judith. And this, you will discover the quotes in the New Testament, but you cannot find its Old Testament equivalent in the 66 book Bible. So when there was this rift in Christianity in 1475, that's more than 15 centuries after the death of Jesus Christ, and our brothers were separating. We call them separating brethren. Some call them those who are protesting, so they are protestants. When they were separating themselves from us, the editing they did was to make sure that everything Calic is taken out of the word of God. So the New Testament was even edited by them. Uh, Martin Luther, who was a Catholic priest from Germany and became the leader of the Protestants and formed the Lutheran church, said the letter of James cannot come from God. Why? Because it talks about oil. But look at how strange it is. Protestants left the Catholic church because Catholics were using oil. And they destroyed the book of James because it mentions anoint people with oil. So he took that book from the Bible and bent it and said it is as good as dry straw. Doesn't fit to be the word of God. Then he took up the entire book of Hebrews in the New Testament. It was a talks about temple, sacrifices, and those stuff. And he used John chapter 4, verse 24 to 26 to argue that through worshippers worship God in spirit and truth. Not in temples and with sacrifices. So the book of Hebrews was also taken out. So New Testament too out. Then he said the gospel of Mark has distorted Greek. And the Greek is not former. It's quite um, a street language. So that cannot be the word of God. So he also took that one out. So he took three books from the New Testament. Then he said the gospel of Luke is a historical record and not a gospel. Because it is addressed to Theophilus, talking about what the Lord did and that, blah, blah, blah. So he also put that in appendix. And the Old Testament, he just went in for the Palestine translations. Just to win the approval of the Palestinian Jews. And to have some of them, because you know, German and Jews are quite closer in culture and, and faith dynamism. So he was using it to lure a lot of people to himself. And that's why they edited the Bible. The challenge with Ghana is that we received our Bible from the Protestants, not from the Catholic Church. So when we first came into contact with the Bible, we thought it is 66 books. But at the time we were receiving the 66 book Bible from our friends, the Protestants in Ghana, the Bible had remained 73 books everywhere. Okay. Uh, so the mindset of Ghana and many of us in Africa that the Bible is 66 books, the Catholic Church have added seven, is very erroneous. If the church in Ghana was evangelized first and foremost by Calis, no, the Portuguese came, they couldn't stabilize because of mosquitoes. They went back. And then later on, 400 years later, they will come back when the Presbyterians have already taken over and started making inroads. And from the northern part, Protestantism has started little, but the Catholic Church did work there. Because of that, what became popular in Ghana was the Protestant Bible, the 66 book Bible. But that is not the word of God. And as the apostle is giving a lot of examples today, mentioning things that are in the Septuagint, but they are completely absent in the 66 book Bible. An example is what we just read about the ghost. Uh -huh. And it is given in my note at the edges that this is from Amos chapter 5, 25 to 27 in the Septuagint. Your Bible wouldn't give you that. Because I'm reading Jerusalem Bible Study Edition. Amos 5, 25 to 27. Yes, and it asks from the Septuagint in my notes. Meaning you go to the Amos in your Bible and you can get it as it is. I hope you get the point now. Yes. I was the Greek version they used. So that is just by the way. But it was a good education. When we are learning the word of God, we should be able to get a proper Bible for learning so that we won't get astray. Now, Stephen, if we remember in the beginning, I mentioned that this is not a speech. It's not a talk. It's not a crusade. It's not a revival. It's a defense in the temple. I know. A defense in the, in the Sahendrin. Defending himself from the accusations that have been leveled against him. And he mentions Moses. And draws attention that Moses had a call after 40 years of departing from Egypt. That makes him 80 years old. So Moses had a call at 80 years. 
And in coming to Egypt, he's coming as somebody who ran away for killing somebody. Moses is going back to Egypt as somebody who ran away from Egypt for killing. And he's coming to be the liberator of Israel. How will he be admitted and welcomed? At times when people get converted and they begin to work in the household of God, we tag them with their past life. And we want to say that they don't fit to work in the church because of their past behavior and the things they did in the past. Many are suffering because of their past record. And unfortunately, somebody may be listening to me who have been blackmailed by father. And it's not permitted to do some work in church because he went all out, she went all out, poured out the heart to father in order for father to know her background. And father has used it against her and she or he is not permitted to come closer to service. And I think that is very bad. When you remember that the resurrection message was given by Mary Magdalene, a woman reported in Luke chapter 8 verse 2 as possessing seven demons. When we discover that Matthew wrote a gospel and he was a task collector and a thief. When we discover that Luke was a Jewish, uh, no, a Greek physician, but he wrote the gospel. When we discover that Mark, no, even Paul, killed before he became a preacher of the gospel, we should admit that the drunkard, the weed smoker, the prostitute, the bad girl, the hypocrite in our street, the fetish can also become a servant of God and serve properly and adequately. So that is what Moses is telling us. When God changes us, we can be changed. You know, at times people think, uh, to wait, if a madman is healed, there are still traces of madness in him. But that is not true with transformation in Christ. When the Son of Man sets you free, you are free indeed. So let us not be afraid of those who have gone through conversion experience. Yes, they will go through learning, they will go through catechesis, they will go through teachings, they will have to go through a whole lot of stuff, but let us know that the Lord transforms and makes whole. You know, Moses himself was afraid. He didn't want to go back. And that is a lesson to us too. The fact that we messed up yesterday doesn't mean we can't go there and make impact. If God is with you, all things are possible. We have to believe that. Where we have destroyed, damaged, God can still transform lives with us as it is as day again to minister to his people. And then we look at how easily people can forget. In this same episode, he mentions how they replaced Moses with Aaron. And you know Aaron is the brother of Moses. They are biological brothers. Aaron is like six years older than Moses. He was lucky to escape the verdict of kill every infant. And then when Moses was born, he was there already and has escaped the punishment of death. Then they say, we don't know what has happened to your brother. Aaron doesn't talk about, let us go and look for him. He doesn't talk about, let us go and search for him. He doesn't talk about, let us go and see if we can find even his grief. He immediately accepts the new leadership position. And it is evident that he has eyed this for a long time. You remember what Aaron would do with Miriam? Are you the only one God can speak through? <laughs> but they were blood siblings. Possibly you, you know where I'm driving at. Mm -hmm. Don't stop working because of jealous people. Many have stopped ministering because of jealous people. They stopped dancing in church because of those comments that came from jealous people. They stopped doing very good things because they are talking about it. They are talking against it. Most of the time, your gossipers are your competitors. Sure, sure. They gossip about you because they want to replace you. Yes. They want your seat. They want your position. And that is why they gossip. Let us keep in mind that if it is God we are serving, and God is the one who has called us, then we should not allow any human agent to discourage us. It is quite difficult, eh? Yeah. But we have to keep our focus on the Lord so that the storm will not overwhelm us. So these are a few stuff you should learn. Uh, this reminds me when you said, uh, I was listening to a message and it was saying that um, you become, uh, if you are the head, you become headlines for the people to talk yes. about you. Yes, yes. That can say the Enipa, any Sunday or Son Takrache. So every time if you are top, and you know when you climb the coconut, 
The higher you climb, the more you are exposed. So if you are not at the top, people will not talk about you. Surely. Yes. <laughs> and one friend of mine will say, only the attracted, attractive mangoes are targeted by stones. Sure, sure. Yes. So gossip should motivate you to keep doing more. Uh, if Aaron is eyeing the seat of his own brother, biological brother, it's not strange if somebody who is not from your family <laughs> wants to take over from you. Uh, but the good news is that if God is on your side, no one can destroy you. When God enthrones you, no one can destroy you. Yes, if God says yes, no one can say no. That's what I'm saying in a different word. If God enthrones you, no one can destroy you. So let us trust God and allow him to enthrone us and nothing can destroy us. So that's the little we have to learn from it. And let us not forget about God when he's quiet. Because in his silence, he's still available, powerful, glorious, and all. And ready to assist in all that he does. If there's no question, we can move okay, on. So 44. Verse 44. Yes. Our fathers had a tent of witness in the wilderness. Even as he who spoke to Moses directed him to make it according to the pattern that he had seen. Our fathers in turn brought it in with Joshua when they disposed the nations which God thrust out for our fathers. So it was until the days of David who found favor in the sight of God and asked leave to find a habitation for the God of Jacob. But it was Solomon who built a house for him. Yet the Most High does not dwell in houses made with hands. As the prophet says, Heaven is my throne and earth my footstool. What house will you build for me? says the Lord, or what is the place of my rest? Did not my hand make all these things? You stepped necked people, and circumcised in heart, and yes, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did not, did not your fathers persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered. You who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. Now, when they heard these things, they were enraged, and they ground their teeth against him. <clears throat> to be frank, <laughs> Stephen is so courageous. Very courageous. <laughs> he is in front of 72 high priests and lawyers, plus all bystanders and onlookers. And in their midst, he looks at their face and says, stubborn people, uncircumcised hearts and years. Hey, as of for you, my when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, the level of your boldness no, is very high. Let's compare this with <laughs> Stephen serving food at table. You know, he was invited to sell food. So, this guy is so humble that he sells food to the poor and the sick. And this food server is not Peter talking, it's not Peter, it's not the Pope. A servant in the household looks straight into authority and tell them, you are stiff naked. You are stubborn. I mean, we need the Holy Spirit. Uh, but before we come, I'll come back to you, stiff naked, stubborn, circumcised in heart and years. The first thing Stephen draws the attention to is that religion is dynamic. Religion is not static. So he starts from, from a burning bush God to a tent dwelling God to a temple dwelling God, to a God among us in Jesus. Mm. So that is the sequence Stephen is building. So much so that we don't, you know, for some of us, the way we saw God when we 
were baptized. It's the same mindset we have until now. No change. The God we discovered, we must change in our knowledge of him. We must grow in our knowledge of him and discover him truly and truly. You know, in mathematics, one plus one is two. Is that not the case? Sure. But one plus one base two is not two. It's zero one. Or it's one one. It's one remainder one. <laughs> when you are using base two. Yes. Ah, so when you okay. grow in mathematics, you will discover that one plus one is not always two. Yes. One plus one is two in base ten. It's two in base three. But one plus one is one one in base two. So when the base changes, answers will change. But our views of God, you know, some people are even predictable in the way they pray. Because since they received the faith, I was tempted to say baptism of the Holy Spirit and they prayed in tongues, the same syllable. And it has become routine, mechanized, and identifiable with the individual. No, we have to grow when we encounter God. He is not always the desert dwelling God who is in the burning bush. He transforms himself to become the God intent, then the God in the temple, and the God among us, living and active. And we should be able to journey and grow into knowledge of this God. You know, when it started, anytime Moses will go to Pharaoh, you read Exodus, the ten plagues, the first two or three, anytime Pharaoh does something, Moses will go to the asker to pray and discover God's will. When Moses started growing, there and there in front of Pharaoh, you listen to God's word and answer. When Moses moved with Israel on the desert, in the beginning, anytime there is a problem, he will go to the tent of meeting. Gradually, he could just pray wherever he was standing and discover God and act accordingly. How are we growing in our knowledge of God after baptism? Is it the same old story? What we knew from, is it Adam or Kwame Nkrumah? <laughs> Carrying the same mindset. Adam and, and Kwame Nkrumah. <laughs> the two together. <laughs> the two independent keepers. <laughs> sure, sure. Ah, so we need to grow in our knowledge of God. Stephen has been able to grow so much so that no, when you check, he was able to quote a minimum of 70 Old Testament passages in a small speech. Isn't it not amazing? Sure an is. unprepared speaker who was not an apostle could quote the Old Testament as if he has been invited for a revival at Tema Comte 2, where I returned from. <laughs> 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 or St. Michael's Hospital, where I was last week. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. You know, he flows. And when you are reading him, you may think this is a prepared speech, well researched and properly documented. But this yes. came <laughs> as temporal. Mm -hmm. It just came and he just delivered, just like that. And we need to be that zealous eh, about the Lord and his ways. And the final thing is reactions to God's power. What was the reaction to God's power from the lawyers, the Pharisees, and the high priests? They became angry. They say they raged. My version said they were infuriated. And then they ground their teeth at him. When we become Christians and believers, when we accept the will of God and we live with God, we should not be afraid of the rage of the crowd. And what happened right after the rage? Let me take this. The Bible was written without chapters and verses. So in the next verse we are going to read, it will make sense until you read to verse 3 of chapter 8. So if you have your Bible in the house, we are about reading as chapter 7 from 55 to chapter 8 verse 3. That makes a complete statement. So the verses were put in later, 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 later by an English guy who didn't even know Greek or understood Greek. So based on his own commentary of the Bible and the way he understands the passages, he put in chapter and verses to make reading and references easy and available. And that is why we have Bible and paragraphs and those stuff. Mm -hmm. So, yes. Father, please, before we move on, um, the verse 48 was saying, yet the Most High does not dwell in houses made with hands, as the, the prophet uh -huh. says. You no, know, he quoted Isaiah 66, but not fully. Mm -hmm. 
Um, we, we're out of time. We don't want to go and read the entire Isaiah 66. Mm -hmm. But we know that it is true. God cannot be contained in a small room. But he chose. When you read the prayer in the blessing of the temple in Jerusalem, the prayer of Solomon, he said, yes, the whole heaven is your throne and the entire earth is your footstool. But you have chosen to dwell in this small space. So it is God's choice to occupy a temple. I don't know, maybe you can put something here then go and read straight away. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 18 to 24. It is better we understand this because many pastors have been using this and they are rendering all churches auditorium. It is becoming as if the church buildings are mere auditorium and they are no more the presence of the Lord. But that is not the case. They misinterpret Isaiah. The second Isaiah, no, what happened is the third Isaiah is that after coming from Ezra, when Israel returned from Ezra, there was no temple. The temple has been destroyed. But people still had to worship God. And Isaiah told them that you don't need temple to have God. I don't know if you are getting the background of Isaiah chapter 36. Sure. So there is no God because there's no temple. That was the mindset to the people. And Isaiah was telling them, no, you don't need temple to possess God. God is with us. So He's right hand in our base. He does not just dwell in houses so built by need, man. We don't need a temple to worship God. Yes. And the impression was that there's no temple here. But worshiping God is possible. Okay. I don't know if you get the point. It's not sure. as if God doesn't dwell in the temple. But now that there's no temple, God can still be worshipped. Yeah. No, that was the point of Isaiah. There's no temple, but God can still be worshipped. Because God does not dwell only in temples. He does not dwell only in places built by human hands. He does not dwell only in occupational environments. He is everywhere. everywhere. And that is our catechism. He is everywhere. So if he is everywhere and the temple is somewhere, then he can also dwell in the temple. Anna? Of course. So let's look at the two covenants from uh, so Hebrews, Hebrews 12, uh, verse 18 to like 25. Okay, uh, so Hebrews 12, 18 to 25. For you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire. That's Sinai. And continue. darkness. That's Sinai again. And gloom. Sinai. And a tempest. Mm -hmm. And the sound of a trumpet. Good. And a voice whose words made the hearers entreat that no further messages he spoke in, be spoken to them. So that was Exodus chapter 19, verse 16 to 18 and as a, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 4 that is what is being described here how God showed himself in the past yes. so let me move on for they could not endure the order that was given mm -hmm. if even a beast touches the mountain it shall be stoned indeed so terrifying was the sight that Moses said I tremble with fear but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God. So he's describing how God revealed himself in the past and how God reveals himself now to us. And now he's saying that where you have come to is Mount Zion. So that's in reference to the temple in Jerusalem. Yeah. That didn't have the Sinai experience. So now we are in the temple of Jerusalem. Continue. The heavenly Jerusalem mm -hmm. and to innumerable angels in festal gathering Good. and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. Good. And to the judge who is God of all. And to the spirit of just men made perfect. But what he's describing cannot be the temple in Jerusalem. But that had just the Ark of the Covenant. Okay. And the altar. And the incense bowl. And the candles. And these they knew are heavenly things. And this is direct reference to Revelation chapter 14. The new Jerusalem in heaven. So straight away, our churches is being compared to heaven. Okay. Yes, continue. And to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks more graciously than the blood of Abel. And straight away, he's changing the blood from sheep to human life. Yeah. You know, the temple in Jerusalem had sheep for sacrifices. Yeah. Sinai had moo, a uh, cattle. They were using cows as Sinai. Then they started using sheep in the temple in Jerusalem. And I talk about human blood, comparing the blood of Abel to the blood that is being used now. So straight away, we discover the Christian temple or the Christian church building 
has Jesus Christ himself offering sacrifices? Uh, a little ahead. 25. Yes. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. So we finish the gospel and we say the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord, Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. We finish and we say the word of God. Thanks, thanks be to God. God. If you start studying the book of Revelation, we will discover that in heaven there is an altar. Okay. There is a candle plate. There is turbo, incense boat. All the things you use in the college church, you will discover they are in the heaven temple. Okay. And you see there is no gate there. You can enter and exit at any time. Any time. And when we get there, we will discover how ushering became important because of security and not because of beauty. Uh, so you discover straight away that God dwells in houses. Ushering for security, not for beauty. Yes. A, a great point. <laughs> so now you discover that God dwells in houses. So deep. God dwells in houses. Yes. But Jerusalem had no temple at the time of the third Isaiah. No, the book of Isaiah is divided into three. We have the first Isaiah, people who have not yet gone in Ezra. So that one was about stop sinning, stop the wrong thing you're doing, otherwise God will punish us. They didn't listen to him. Then they went into Ezra. He had to motivate and encourage them. God will take us back. It shall be well. He will renew our strength. That's why we have 40. Those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. Let us not lose hope. Better days can come. Then the third Isaiah is when they have returned from Babylon. The temple is already destroyed. There was no place of worship. So they had to be motivated. Said, Even in your house, God listens. Yes. God, God is not located just in a temple. So if there's no temple, there's still God. And that is why in Isaiah 65, verse 24, he will tell them, even when you are praying in your home, before you open your mouth, he's hearing. And before you finish speaking, he has already answered you. And that is one thing we should keep in mind. So when he said God has not dwell in buildings made by human hands, he doesn't mean churches are not important. But he meant if there is no church, if there is no church building, you can still worship can God. still worship God. Yes. Okay. So, mm -hmm. but I move to us. Us. Yeah, okay. we are back to us. <laughs> so, what? Chapter 7, verse 55. 55 to chapter 8, verse 3. Okay. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened. And the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together upon him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he prayed. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he knelt down and cried out with a, with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold the sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Chapter 8. And Saul was consenting to his death. And on that day, a great persecution arose against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the region of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. <clears throat> so we discover that it makes sense after reading to this part. Sure. So you don't limit your quotations to a chapter and say chapter now ascended. Uh, that's why the Catholic Church. If you read today's first reading well in Isaiah, check the Odu or the reading guide. Verse 1 to this, this to that, then you come back to 7 and 8. After reading, after reading 21 to 22, we come back and read 7 and 8. And that is best when you go and read from Kings. You will discover that Isaiah had his write up a bit distorted. Okay. And it makes sense when the 7 and 8 is placed at the edge, at the end, instead of in the middle. And that is why the Catholic Church, who knows? Because we are the owners of the Word of God. We wrote the Word of God and we are the custodians. So we know how to manipulate our book. That's why we're able to tell you, finish reading 23, 
before you come and read seven and eight. And it will make sense to you. Otherwise, you won't find the sense in it. And a similar thing is happening here. Now, you discover that Paul enters, Saul enters house by house, arresting people. But it is, the apostles remain in Jerusalem. We are doing a little bit of theology now. Why was Paul doing that? The question I'm even asking is, that is one of the questions we are coming to answer. The other question is, why was the apostles not arrested? Though they were also living in Jerusalem. Now, Stephen, we know, I mentioned to us last two weeks that he's a Greek. You remember when we were talking about the seven deacons? Yeah. I told you Stephen is not a pure Jew. He's a Greek proselyte, like a Greek converted to Judaism. And he has become so much conversant with the Jewish Bible. I mean, I want to challenge some Christians today. A non-Jew, or a Jew from a Greek background, born outside Palestine, can know the Bible this way. Okay. And quote it this way. We don't have excuse <laughs> to say we don't know the word of God. Of course. <laughs> and because he was Greek, the insult was double. When he told them they are stubborn and stiff necked, they felt it double. How can a non circumcised boy, a stranger, a stranger <laughs> come into our high place and insult us this day? So the first persecution was targeted against non Jewish Christians. Great. That is why the apostles were spared. So they arrested all except the apostles. And that is why the apostles were spared. But before we come that, throughout the New Testament, especially in Luke chapter 1 verse 15, and most especially in John, anytime Jesus talks about heaven, he says, you see the son of man seated, seated. at the right, right hand. hand. But in the situation of Stephen, Jesus was standing, saluting the active man tell him, bravo. Human stones does not determine heavenly judgment. No. The stones of the priest did not determine the judgment of Stephen. On earth, he was being stoned by the high priest and his people. In heaven, he was being saluted by the Lord. What matters is God's verdict. What matters is God's verdict. So if you are in the renewal, if you are in the church, and everybody is against you in church, ask yourself, what about God's verdict? Stephen was not stoned by ancestral worshippers. Sure. He was stoned by Jews, Jews who accepted and believed in one God, the Father Almighty. People who had the Ten Commandments and they knew that shall not kill. <laughs> he was stoned by people who had the temple. He was stoned by people who knew the word of God cover to cover. You know, that time there was no printing press. He was stoned by the people who copied the Bible with their hand. So that others will get copy. He was stoned by people who prayed five times a day. He was stoned by people who offered two sheep in the morning and two sheep in the evening to the Lord in the temple of Jerusalem. He was stoned by people who paid their tithe. He was stoned by people who obeyed all the laws of the Jewish Bible. The way Sister Barbara is looking at me, I'm even afraid. Uh, no, but I'm not necessarily <laughs> that you being afraid. But just, that's just thoughts is coming to my mind. Even if a Jewish could do that, it's the same thing that is uh, happening, happening in to Christian us uh, as Christians. Mm -hmm. uh, the same people that uh, read the word, know the scripture, know this, know that, know that, know the do's and the don'ts. They are the same people that backbite. You know, <laughs> let us keep in mind that people in power are not always the powerful ones. Okay. People can be in power. And they will use their power on the fiscal realms to frustrate you. Of but it doesn't make them the powerful ones. Even when Adam, when Abraham, Isaac and Jacob died, they, they didn't have standing ovation in heaven. <laughs> Even the Blessed Virgin Mary didn't see Jesus standing. In fact, Stephen's own is a revelation. <laughs> And look at it. No, in the same uh, environment, you a stone on the ground, a salute above. above sure. So what are you looking for? An applause on earth and a moody face up there? Mm -hmm. Or a stone here and a salute there? Salute, salute. Many modern Christians are going for physical applause. Of course. But some applause are dangerous. If you don't understand, ask the mosquito. 
But father, come to think of it. Uh, this thought came to mind. Many people are going for physical ap ap applause. Yeah. But what makes them do that? Um, we are in a world, in a situation, all that, although what people say does not really matter, but at a point in time, it matters. Because we are not convinced of eternal realities. Okay. We think heaven is not rare. Some don't even believe Jesus died on the cross. He was killed, butchered, and murdered like a common criminal. Some don't believe that their savior was brutalized and destroyed anyhow. Some don't want to accept the fact that the, the, the Lord and Savior has done so much for us. And that is the problem we have. That is the challenge we have. That is the confusion in our Christendom. We are not convinced of eternal life. We are not convinced of eternity. We are not convinced of salvation. And that is why we are so much concerned about what they will say. But if you follow what they will say, then you are not following Jesus. So there has to be a conviction in our day-to-day -day life. And no other confusion. We want to follow Jesus without the cross. Anyway, that's true. We that is the biggest problem. Of course. So we prefer Lewin's song <laughs> to Jesus' words. Lewin says we should follow Jesus with a ladder. Jesus said we should follow him with cross. Both are made of wood. Choose one. <laughs> <laughs> and I love a beautiful feature, feature about the uh, Christmas and Easter put together. Mm -hmm. You know the Christmas wreath? Yeah. No, it is also made circular. Sure, sure. And very green. Yeah, greenish. So somebody made it and divided it to do half is green, the other half is dry and tony. And he said, This is the season and this is the reason. Okay, okay, okay. You get a point okay. now? Sure, sure. So the sure. reason for the gloomy life is the cross. If you follow me, deny yourself, take up your cross. Look at how he died. He died because he was focused on Jesus, he could not even curse his enemies. He prayed for their conversion. Lord, this 72 cannot go to hell. Forgive them and let them come and join me. <laughs> you get a point now. It's a, it's, a, it's a powerful prayer. Nobody, if you bring it to our world now, nobody would pray such prayer. Oh, oh fortunately, some are doing. Yes. When but you are reading it, Christians and you, you, you wouldn't get the maximum doing that. Interestingly, we also don't face much challenges. As compared to what? Yes. You know, we are tested with fire. If you have not gone through challenging, challenging moments, you won't, see how, you won't see how strong or weak you are. Uh -huh. But many are doing well. Some are doing really well. I meet Christians who are going through hell and they are still holding on to their feet. And you are inspired. They are still holding on to the cross. They are still holding on to Jesus. And I know some are listening who are still holding on. I'm encouraging you to keep holding on. The church laws may be difficult and challenging. God's laws may be difficult and challenging. But allow the stones... The stone that builders rejected were used to stone Come, Stephen. Come the kind of stone. <laughs> so that kind of stone was used to stone <laughs> Stephen. And it will be used to glorify you in heaven, eternity. Right. Yes, the stones they throw at you will be the beautiful edifice you have right. enjoying in eternity at the end. It's difficult to pick up the cross. Even Jesus prayed against it. If it is possible, let this car pass by me. Pass but not my will. But your will, your will be, be done. done. Lord, if it is possible, mm. may all of us not experience the cross but not in accordance with your will in our will let your will, will be, done. be done amen amen father not my will but your will be done Sp stephen inspired by the holy spirit spoke and the glory of the Lord was manifested. Stephen was stoned on earth, but he received the crown of glory in heaven. By our endurance, we'll gain our lives. Thank you, our lovely viewers, for following us. And also sharing for others also to follow and learn about the word of God.
Our sister Francesca Sam is watching us. God bless you, sis. And you squam make a champ on says it's so awesome. Kofi Yesu says theology made simple and practical. God bless you. Bayward says it's this is deep. Jay, so spirit-filled message. God bless you, Father. Augustina J. Daku says, God bless you, Father. You are indeed transforming many lives throughout this program. God bless you, our lovely viewers. It was the word became flesh, screaming live from the CCR Center at Doom To help us with this program, you can support through our Momo number 0555 4230. 0555 4230. So this year we come your way with fresh graduate and alumni conference, Joshua Youth Conference, and course. You can't afford to miss it. Start preparing so that you can join us for this awesome program. God bless you all. The Father will give us his last message. We thank God. Uh, he's challenging us. But I know it is possible. Let us not lose hope. Let's keep trusting. We thank all those who have been sharing and motivating us. We also ask that they donate as well and support a good cause like this. And I know for many of the youth, we will be meeting at Joshua Youth Conference. Sure, sure. Uh, you have to make it a point to come. You can't miss it. Not at all. <laughs> we have to meet at Joshua Youth Conference. So God bless us all. Amen. Uh, so, Father, take our closing prayer. So we pray in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You are our King and Lord, and we thank you. We acknowledge your name and we bless you. Be close to us and be attentive to us. Draw close to us, O Lord, and touch us deeply. May we be transformed like Stephen. May we be empowered and may we be filled. That we can also move out and make you known everywhere. Bless us, empower us, and strengthen us. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, for he is our God forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless us all. So see you the same time next week. A lovely weekend to our soul. And una usha ube nyampa Chelo ko ube nyampa Chelo ko ube nyampa ube nyampa Wachila mse mse Hallelujah And una usha ube nyampa